Now, we know that Swarm was founded out of frustration over a lack of connectivity options at low cost. I mean, so here we are with uh, the smallest satellite in space today at the cheapest possible price. Talk to us about, about how this is the new paradigm for communication. Yeah, absolutely. So you're absolutely right. We have the smallest two-way communication satellites in space. We actually launched 28 today. So we have 120 um, that creates this constellation around the Earth, providing coverage of every point on Earth several times a day. Um, and what we're doing is we're able to offer uh, satellite connectivity. So being able to connect devices any point on the planet at all times for only $5 a month. Um, conventionally, that's been about 20x um, higher. So we're able to bring that price point down and bring a lot of people online for the first time that could never afford satellite before. So when all your 150 satellites are deployed in space, what would it mean for the world? What would it mean for businesses, the rural areas, developing countries, critical industries? What can we expect? Yeah, definitely. So um, even today, we have a commercial service that's up and operating, um, and we connect um, devices all over the world in a bunch of different industries, agriculture, logistics, ground transportation, maritime, fire detection, tracking vaccines to ensure that things stay within temperature ranges, making sure that rainforests are protected. There's a million super interesting um, examples that we learn about every day. And basically, we're able to bring back small amounts of very valuable data uh, from any point on earth at all times and allow business owners and decision makers to um, make really informed decisions about how they should run their businesses. We also ensure that people are safe wherever they might be and can always kind of call home. Um, it's, it's not really a phone service, but they can tweet home or send a message home um, to ensure their, you know, their safety and that we know where everyone is at all times. Uh, we know, if I got it right, your satellites offer lower speed data service compared with what's being offered by other companies right now. What's the value of lower speed data service? What can it change potentially? Yeah, so the fact that it's so low cost, um, it's also low speed, and we transfer small amounts of super valuable data. Um, and this allows um, people, wherever they might be, you know, wherever their assets might be, anywhere on the planet, to bring back data. And we believe this can have a tremendous impact on the infrastructure of connectivity um, and allow people to um, bring back you know, data, make informed decisions, and um, potentially run their businesses differently. Uh, size matters, at least uh, where satellites are concerned. You're able to offer low prices for two-way communication satellite services because you've shrunk the size of the satellite. Do the satellites get bigger? or smaller from here as you get more funding? Give us a sense of the trend going forward. Yeah, definitely. So, you know, obviously our satellites have shrunk down and we've been able to offer this incredible service because of the launch economics. So the smaller the satellite, the lower cost it is to launch. Um, and then we can share those cost savings with our users. Um, as we think to the future, um, you know, people want smaller and smaller devices on the ground, smaller antennas, lower power. Um, and the physics kind of says that if you make stuff smaller and lower powered on the ground, the devices in space have to get bigger or have more power. So that's kind of the trade off that we're dealing with. Um, so I think that we're probably going to see our satellites get a little bit bigger, but be way more powerful and offer this incredible service. Um, that is something like the size of your cell phone or maybe eventually even into your cell phone um, in terms of connectivity. Hopefully that's going to help us in uh, transmitting live when we're in some rural areas at some point as well, because right now it's super <laughs> expensive to, to, have, to have news, you know, travel through satellite. You know, totally. what's your own aspiration, Sarah? I mean, what comes after launching 150 satellites in space? What are some of the ideas? Yeah, you know, I think at this point, we almost have this global network that we aspire to build. Um, and it's really about trying to figure out how we can best serve our customers. So how can we get devices in their hands? How can we develop products that they will integrate into existing devices or even create new products that we've never heard of before for the first time? So we are really focused on, on actually the ground segment and making that experience as seamless as picking up um, an Android phone and going through the Google Fi 
um, kind of data platform, making it that easy even for industrial applications. We think that that makes um, it easier for more companies on the commercial side as well as on the commercial side or on the um, consumer side to adopt the technology. Uh, Sarah, I have the polling results right now, and the question, just to remind you, what excites you most about space? We have 33% of our viewers choosing mass space travel and tourism, 42% the possibility and discovering other life forms on other planets, 17% uh, for the economic potential of shifting mining, energy generation, and industrial production into space, and 8% colonizing other planets like Mars. So overwhelming response when it comes to the, uh, the possibility and discovering other life forms and planets that links back to our previous conversation, which Andy had about how, you know, we want to discover perhaps maybe some intelligent life forms uh, in other planets. Your own choice would be, Sarah? My own choice would not be on that list. <laughs> my choice would be how can we, my choice would be something along the lines of how can we improve life on earth uh, through space? And I think that that is something we're, we're on the brink of really, um, really exploring. So GPS systems, something we take for granted every day to navigate around is a, is a space system. I think Swarm with our low cost connectivity can help change how we think of comms on the earth. And there's a bunch of other environmental monitoring, climate change, um, many other great applications of things we can do from space that we can't do from the ground to improve life on Earth. So that's really what I'm most excited about. Sorry, it's not on your list. <laughs> <laughs> we'll include that the next time. I'm just wondering, you say we're on the cusp of that. I mean, how soon do you think that will happen? Yeah, I think that we're going to see some major changes in connectivity over the next five to 10 years. Just how we go from our homes where we have Wi-Fi to outside in a city where we have cell and it, it kind of switches automatically. I think we're going to experience that with satellite. You'll go out into the forest and your phone will, automatic, will automatically switch over to satellite. Maybe that will be Swarm um, or some other system. And we'll totally take that for granted. I also think we'll take for granted that we can track people and assets regardless of where they are on the planet. There's a lot of people and aircraft and container ships and dogs and kids and scooters and bikes that go missing. Um, and that's insane and that should never happen again. And I think with Swarm and other people from the community that are developing these technologies, we're, we're not gonna see that anymore, which is pretty cool, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, pretty cool. Uh, suffice <laughs> to say, there is a space fever going on, right? More than a dozen startups building their own networks of nano satellites, all enabling a new kind of connectivity around the clock for everything, like you said, uh, on the planet. Uh, is this necessarily a good thing? Is there anything to be concerned about? Yeah, I mean, I think there is actually hundreds of startups doing different things. I think there's tens in the kind of CubeSat IoT space. I actually view it as a nice validation that there are a lot of investors and entrepreneurs and ideas um, that you know people want to explore and that people are getting the funding and support to explore. So I see it as all really positive. Um, I think there's probably a lot of kind of noise in the space. People like to talk about paper satellite companies or paper rocket companies as not quite real, but hey, we all start on paper before we get stuff into space. Um, I think what we're probably going to see is a lot of um, kind of synergies or um, companies will start to combine. They'll, you know, one will acquire the other or the talent will kind of combine into a, a single company. And I think that's all for the better as well. If the technologies are synergistic and if they can bring more to the world, if they're bigger together than kind of individually. Throw forward three to five years. How do you see the future of connectivity evolving in that period? Yeah, definitely. So I think it's it's kind of what I said before. I hope in five years we just go between Wi-Fi cell and um, some sort of satellite um, in an auto magic way, um, and that you know it, the the cost of satellite is at a point where it's quite similar to cellular or at least cellular IoT today, and businesses can decide to invest in just the one of those that they need um, and are able to scale out their businesses across the globe without connectivity being a limiting factor. I think we're also going to see other networks come along that will have higher capacity, lower latency, um, better security features, all sorts of great things that you know consumers as well as industrial users want. Um, and I, I know that Swarm will be part of that, and I think you'll see improvements in connectivity, and um, it, it will become seamless, which um, I hope we don't have to think about it, really. <laughs> kind of goes away. Uh, only we talked about 
you know, what excites you the most about the future of technology? What about the dangers that science and technology can be misused? Yeah, that's a, I mean, that's a massive topic. I'm not sure that I'm qualified to, to fully address that. I think that as entrepreneurs, it's, it's really important to think about, you know, the good ways my technology could be used and the bad ways and recognize that, you know, you can never 100% mitigate against all of those possible outcomes. The only way to do that would be to not develop a technology that also does a lot of good. Um, so we try to be thoughtful about, you know, how are we thinking about security? How are we thinking about how we're entering other countries? Um, and, and really trying to offer a global service. So that's kind of one of our challenges um, and play out kind of worst case scenarios and put in place all of the mitigations that are reasonable um, and, and weigh that with some of the, sometimes it's a, a business downside to, to do the right thing and the secure thing. Um, and we always try to be really thoughtful of, of how we're building things.